So indeed, the Middle East case is interesting as it seems to define a world inequality frontier with extreme levels of inequality as Luca showed you a few minutes ago. But from a methodological viewpoint, it is also an interesting example of how the new methodology used in the report and based on the combination of national accounts, survey data and fiscal data, enabled the researcher of uh, Widward to tell completely different stories on inequality um, in emerging countries. So let me come back to the graph uh, Luca just uh, showed you. So, um, indeed, if we take at face value uh, official inequality statistics, the gray area on the right-hand side would be barely visible, which means that there would be no emirs or no old magnates within the, the top 1% of the global income distribution, something which is a little bit hard to believe. And uh, concretely in the data, it meant that we did not observe individuals with more than three times um, the average income. So it is really thanks to the increased availability of fiscal data that followed the discussion on uh, Thomas' book, Capital, uh, in the 21st century, that we were able to, uh, if I may say so, make appear this gray area and um, change the dominant narrative on inequality in the region. So what was uh, this dominant narrative? So given the great uh, political instability in the region uh, that um, um, exists for now uh, several decades, it is natural to ask whether the political turmoil is related to the specific level and structure of socio-economic inequality in the region. And indeed, following the Arab Spring, there has been a renewed interest in the measurement of inequality uh, in the region, given that social justice was among the main demands of demonstrators. And um, all studies find low or even very low levels of inequality, suggesting that the source of dissatisfaction must be found elsewhere. So this surprising fact, that is that on the one hand, uh, measured inequality are very low, but on the other hand, uh, that inequality was a source, a major source that led to uh, such a big upheaval was coined uh, the Arab inequality puzzle. And in this chapter of the report, we try to answer this puzzle in two ways. First, uh, we correct upward existing estimates using fiscal data, and we find that the Middle East seems to be the world's most unequal region. And this is due to both enormous inequality between countries, and in particular between oil-rich countries and population-rich countries, but also to large inequality within countries. And the second way we uh, tackle this puzzle is by changing the level of analysis and by um, studying inequality at the regional level. So the point we want to make here is that there is a need to go beyond the concept of nation states to study inequality and to gain further insight in uh, international inequality pattern. And um, so of course we do not pretend that nation states are not relevant. Um, but um, we think that they may not be the unique or the most meaningful way to um, analyze inequality in some cases. First, because perception about inequality are not only determined by within countries inequality. And second, because changing the level of analysis may affect the measurement of inequality and help us gain further insight on the determinants of this inequality. And indeed, when we do this uh, exercise, this aggregation, we find pretty alarming uh, results. As the top 10% uh, uh, at the regional level equals 61%, whereas in all the countries of the region, they vary between 45 uh, and 55% of national income. And this level is way higher to what we observe in other similar regions with a comparable population size as the top decide equals 37% um, of national income, of regional income in Western Europe, 47% in the US, and 55% in Brazil, a country which is often presented as the world, uh, as the most unequal in the world. So you may say, and uh, rightly so, that uh, our results are not surprising, and that by pulling together countries with such different average income as Yemen and Saudi Arabia, we automatically increase inequality. 
But actually, the extent of this increase is not straightforward, and this is well illustrated in this figure. So the orange line represents the evolution of the top 10% in Western Europe. And the green line represents the same evolution, but this time by pulling Western European countries with uh, Eastern European countries, so with lower average um, income. So indeed, inequality increases, but of very few uh, percentage points, and this small gap even decreases over, over time, so that the European levels of inequality do not reach uh, the US ones. So, on the contrary, in the Middle East, the increase uh, that results from our pooling leads to, uh, is approximately of um, 5%. And how can we explain such uh, substantial effect? So this is first due to enormous inequality between countries that you can well see in this um, table. So our study focuses on 15 countries from Egypt to Iran and from the Gulf countries to Turkey. And if we decompose um, the region in subgroups, so Turkey, Iran, Gulf countries, and other Arab countries, we see that they receive very different share of income given their uh, population size. And for an example, in 2016, Gulf countries represent only 15% of the total regional population, but receive approximately half of the total regional income. And this leads to major uh, gaps in average income over the region. But our results also come from um, very large inequality within countries. And it's really the combination of these two effects that leads to um, our results. Um, the problem with inequality within countries is that there is an important lack of data for the poorest countries in the region and the richest countries as Gulf countries, so that we still probably underestimate inequality within countries. So let me focus here on uh, the Gulf countries example. So uh, as you may know, um, the Gulf countries are characterized by a very dual social structure with, on the one hand, migrant workers who migrate and work under the highly exploitative uh, sponsorship system, and on the other hand, nationals who have an incentive to uh, defend the privilege derived uh, from the oil revenue, and so to restrict access to nationality and to maintain this uh, polarized structure with very different legal, uh, social and economic status uh, with the migrant workers. But these workers do not represent a, mi a minority. Uh, they are actually a majority in the population as their share uh, increased from 45% in 1990 to uh, almost 60% in, 19, uh, in uh, 2016. And they even represent 90% of the total population. So this uh, should lead to extreme inequality levels. But the data for the moment do not enable us to um, uh, perfectly capture this uh, dual structure. So we were extremely cautious on the way to deal with it. And in the parallel uh, and more technical session tomorrow uh, on uh, inequality in emerging and developing countries, I will propose alternative way to uh, measure inequality in Gulf countries. And this would lead to higher uh, inequality estimates with a top 10% reaching, reaching almost 70% of the total regional income. So, We've looked at uh, an extreme example of inequality, and um, we showed that this comes from the use of fiscal data and from the regional focus uh, adopted. And so to conclude, uh, I would like to stress that in the most unequal uh, countries in the world, inequality have very different origin. So from, uh, from Brazil or South Africa, Inequality comes from um, the legacy of slavery and also from racial and, social, uh, racial and colonial cleavages. In the Middle East, on the contrary, the origins seem to be more modern as they are directly linked to the functioning of modern capitalism and in particular to the geography of oil ownership and the transformation of oil revenues into permanent financial endowments. And this uh, stresses that capital concentration has big impact on inequality and that uh, the dynamics of 
public and private capital ownership are critical and should be studied uh, carefully. And uh, this is what uh, the third chapter of the report does and that Luca will uh, present to you now. So in the third part of the, of the report, we ask a very uh, simple and basic, but essential and very often overlooked question, which is what is uh, the distribution of national capital? Uh, and what is the repartition between private capital and public capital? And up to recently, there was also very little data to assess these questions. And thanks to the work of Gabriel Zuckman and uh, Thomas Piketty, it uh, is now much easier to uh, assess this question based on uh, data. So what is, what is public capital? Uh, let's just uh, stress that public capital is the sum of all physical assets of uh, governments, like schools, like hospitals, like public infrastructures, their financial assets, their equity, minus their debts. Private capital is the sum of all uh, assets of the private sector, again, net of debts. And here we look at the repartition uh, in the total national wealth of these two uh, big uh, components. What we show is that since the 1980s, there were very large transfers of public capital to private capital in nearly all countries, rich countries, even higher in emerging countries. And uh, this uh, contributed to a very sharp decline in uh, public uh, capital in the context of a very high increase in uh, the value of private wealth when measured uh, as a percentage of national income. So this arguably limits the ability of governments this uh, very low position of public capital arguably limits the ability of governments to invest in education, to invest in health, to invest, invest in environmental, tr environmental transition, investments which will be necessary in the future to uh, limit uh, the rise of inequality. And in any case, um, the, this rise in private capital has important implication on the distribution of wealth and of the inequality level in one country given the accumulation and multiplicative nature of a private capital. So uh, a first graph, uh, first key graph in this part of the report, we see here uh, private capital on the top of the graph express, expressed uh, as a percentage of national income in rich countries, Spain, UK, Japan, France, US, and Germany. These values increased from around 300% in 1970 to uh, for, from 400% to uh, 650% today. So a very neat increase. We see here the impact of uh, housing or financial bubbles in Spain, in Japan, where in fact these do not impact the longer uh, uh, longer term trend. We also see the impact now of the financial crisis in this novel data in the US, for instance, in the UK or in France to a lesser extent. But again, the financial crisis does not alter the long term trend. At the same time, the value of public capital moved from around 70% of national income to close to zero and to even below zero in certain countries. So what does this mean? This means that if the governments of the US or Canada were to sell all their assets, all their schools, all their hospitals, all, uh, all, their, um, all their financial assets, well, they would not even be able to repay their debts. And they would then have to pay uh, a rent to owners of schools, to owners of hospitals. So arguably, arguably this is a major economic uh, fact of the last decades, which deserves um, serious attention. Now, what happened in the emerging world? This is what we uh, show here. The rise in private wealth has been even faster in the emerging world because it was much lower uh, in Russia, in China, around 100% of national income in 1980, and we are now at levels of private wealth expressed as a percentage of national income that are comparable to those of uh, the rich world. Let's look at uh, the decline of uh, public wealth uh, 
in, from a different angle, now we express it as a share of total wealth rather than as a percentage of national income. So basically in China in 1978, public capital represented 70% of national wealth, so 30% for uh, private wealth at, at that time, and this decreases to 30% at the end of the period. In a rich country, we move from 20% to close to zero or below zero. What we stress here is that the levels um, that we observe today in China are actually comparable to uh, the mixed economy period in rich countries from the 1950s to the uh, 1980s. So arguably the Chinese government is much more able to invest, to do a lot of investments which are uh, complicated in, in uh, rich countries. So what is the result of this decline? What is the explanation of this decline in public uh, capital in rich countries? Well, privatizations and the rise of public debt, which we discuss uh, in the report. Now, there are indeed exceptions to this general pattern. Let's look at, it, at an exception. So this is the case of Norway. So in Norway, uh, the share of public capital in national wealth amounted to 30% in uh, 1978 and is now close to 60 percent. So now you may say, okay, but this is only due to oil in Norway. Well, here we want to say that no, it's not only due to oil because a country like Russia, for instance, also has a lot of subsoil assets and did not invest it in the same way as uh, Norway did. So in, in, uh, in Russia, the privatization of these assets only benefited a handful of individuals. And this is what we discuss in the fourth part of the report on a global wealth inequality dynamics of wealth inequality, not between the private sector and the public sector, but among individuals. And the first point we make is that this inequality, this wealth inequality among individuals is the result of the large transfers of private wealth to public wealth, which I just discussed, and of the large rise in income inequality, uh, which were discussed in the previous uh, part of this presentation and uh, of the report. So it is really the, the combination of these two uh, forces. Now, let me repeat the points that I made at the beginning, which is wealth data remains today particularly opaque. So there are a lot of wealth reports published out there regularly on an annual uh, basis. Well, we are not able at the moment, we feel that it, it is not the moment to publish data on the world as a whole, because we only want to produce wealth data that is really systematic and comparable across country, and to really have this effort of transparency in the data we produce. We look at, when we look at other reports, it is often hard to really understand how the data was produced. For all the data that is here, if you go to the website, we really published all the computer codes, all the technical notes behind each and every series. So we observe, so despite this absence, this limitation of data in many countries, we can already say uh, a few interesting uh, remarks on the evolution of global wealth inequality. So here, we only group together China, Europe, and the US, and we see a rise in wealth inequality among individuals in these regions, with the top 1% share of wealth increasing from 28% in 1980 to 33% today. When the bottom 75% oscillated around 10%, so indeed wealth is much more concentrated than uh, income. Now, if we look at country by country trajectories with a uh, long term perspective, we see the decline in wealth inequality from the early uh, uh, from the early 20th century to the 1980s and the rise afterwards. The rise again, which happened at different speeds, like for income, very fast, uh, very abrupt in Russia, very important and progressive in the USA and more moderate in uh, UK and uh, in France. If we look at the global level, when we put these countries together, this is the evolution of global wealth inequality among individuals with the top 1% wealth share uh, moving from 28 to 33% of the period and we see the stabilization of the bottom 75% wealth share. How do we explain these dynamics? Well, in order to explain these dynamics, it is important to go back to uh, the country level analysis. So why were there such 
a differential in the rate of uh, growth of wealth at the very top of the distribution versus the average. Well, for, in order to do that, we need to look at the complexity of the mechanics, of the me mechanics and the, of the dynamics of wealth accumulation. So in China, in Russia, I mentioned this before, it is a very unequal process of privatization, which drives uh, the, the, the trends that we observe here. In the US, a uh, very uh, sharp decline in tax progressivity, very high income inequality, which contributed to increase wealth inequality. In France, in the UK, we see a moderation in this rise in wealth inequality, and we discuss in the report, and notably on the part on wealth inequality, on which Jonathan Goupy, Bertrand uh, Garbanti have worked with, with Thomas uh, Piketty, that there is uh, an impact of, there's a moderating impact of the housing sector because the middle class owns a large share of uh, housing in their total amount of wealth. So when the, the real estate prices increase, this tends to moderate the gap, the increasing gap between the very top and the middle class. This is what we observe in the UK and in France. And also in the case of Spain, which is the second focus of this presentation, and these focuses are really meant as an illustration of the level of detail that you would find in the full world inequality report and also uh, the, the sessions that, we f that will follow this presentation in the coming uh, two days. So Clara uh, Martinez Toledano is uh, now uh, going to present the complexity of the links between uh, private wealth uh, accumulation and uh, the concentration of wealth. Thank you, Luca. So as Luca has already introduced, the interactions between the rise in uh, private, wealth to national, uh, private wealth and uh, wealth inequality are quite complex. And Spain is a very interesting case to illustrate this fact, since the private wealth to national income ratio has dramatically increased in the last two decades. It started at the level of more or less 400% in the 70s, 80s, but suddenly with the uh, beginning of the housing bubble at the end of the 90s, it rose dramatically, reaching the peak of 700% in 2007. And after the burst of the bubble in 2007, it decreased, but it is still at a much higher level nowadays, around 650% than the level Spain, Spain had in the 80s and 70s. On the contrary, if you look at the series of public wealth to national income ratio, you see that Spain has more or less evolved uh, with the similar trends than the rest of advanced economies. It is also interesting to point out that the level that Spain um, reached in 2007 is unprecedented, since if you compare it to the bubble that Japan experienced in 1990, you see that it is still much higher. So this huge rise in the private wealth to national income ratio was mainly due to the rise in housing prices and the stock of housing that Spain experienced during the uh, housing boom, which was, was started uh, in the beginning of the 90s. However, the interesting uh, finding is that even though Spain has experienced this huge rise in the private wealth to national income ratio, the fluctuations in wealth inequality has, have been very, very little over the last 30 years. You see that the top 10 didn't change much, not even the middle 40 nor the bottom 50. And it is very interesting to understand why is it the case, why uh, this complex interaction between uh, the huge rise uh, in private wealth and the constant wealth inequality is happening. First of all, uh, it is important to mention that housing has uh, um, worked as has smoothed concentration during this period because it benefits more the middle than the top. And this is also something uh, we observe in other countries like France and UK, where uh, we see that wealth concentration has been much moderate during this uh, period of time, like the, the last years, because uh, housing prices have also increased. But in the case of Spain, it is a, a, a particular thing is that the very, very top owns a lot of housing. As you can see, uh, in the period of the bubble, almost half of the portfolio of, for, of the top 10, of the top one, sorry, uh, owned housing. And um, this is also the case at the very, very top of the distribution. 
this uh, figure is the cross, the cross section for 2013, and you see that even the top 0 0.01 owns a very large uh, fraction of housing. And this contrasts with countries that have similar levels of wealth concentration, like Spain, like the case of France, where you see that the picture is very, very different, even though the wealth uh, concentration levels are similar. You see that the very, very top has a um, larger taste for financial assets, contrary to what we see in Spain. <laughs> and again, uh, what you see is that the middle, for the middle, housing is the most important asset, and this is why uh, the increase in housing prices have not have contributed to smooth concentration, uh, the long-term levels of uh, wealth concentration dynamics. If we now um, try to look at what happened in the short run uh, during the housing bubble in Spain, it is interesting to look at the differences in savings rates across wealth groups. This figure depicts the distribution of saving rates as a percentage of income for the well, top 10 wealth group, middle 40 and bottom 50. And the first uh, important thing to point out is that there is a large stratif stratification across wealth groups. The top 10 saved more during the whole period, the middle 40 saved less, and the bottom 50 way less. However, as you can see, there are differences before the bubble uh, uh, and after the bubble. After the bubble, the bottom 50 couldn't uh, save, uh, in fact, they had negative savings rates. And um, this can be explained by the fact that uh, unemployment rate increased dramatically in Spain during this period of time, and the bottom was more hit by, the, by this uh, unemployment. And um, also by, uh, by the fact that um, the bottom 50 couldn't, like they were, they, they, they were high indebted as compared to the top 10. Because they uh, also accumulated some housing and they had to repair their mortgages. But this doesn't explain, even though we have these uh, huge uh, differences in savings rates, this doesn't explain why we don't observe large uh, uh, increases in wealth concentration during this period of time. In order to explain this, these two figures uh, can give the answer. If we decompose the savings rates by asset type, on the left-hand side you have the savings rate for housing, and on the right-hand side you have the savings rate for financial assets, you see that the top 10, exactly at the point in which the bubble got burst, started to decrease their saving on housing, and quickly adjusted to accumulate more financial assets, which, who had lost, uh, which had lost uh, less value during this period of time. So the top managed to reallocate their portfolio much faster than the middle uh, who, and the bottom that couldn't do any adjustment. And this uh, contributed to smooth wealth concentration before and after the bubble. And that's why we don't see uh, any big changes. All these figures that I have shown you until now uh, were without taking into account offshore assets. But offshore assets, and Gabriel Sukman is going to talk more, much more about this afterwards, um, have increased um, in the last years. And this is also the case in Spain, where you see that uh, in 1985, Spain had around 5,000 5, million euros of offshore, uh, unreported offshore wealth uh, in um, paradise, in, like, in offshore um, paradises. However, um, there has been a huge increase, and currently, uh, we are, uh, Spain has uh, unreported offshore assets of more than 140 uh, million euros. And this is larger than the global estimate that Gabriel Sugman has calculated uh, for uh, the world, which, which is that 6% of, uh, um, of, of private wealth is held uh, in offshore assets and is unreported. In Spain, this is 8.6. So if we were to adjust the series, including this, uh, offshore assets, wealth concentration would have been less moderate and it would, be, uh, it would have increased more than uh, what we observe. And now I leave the floor to um, Luca again because he's going to talk about tackling global inequality. So in the, in the final part of uh, the report, we uh, make projections on the future of global income and wealth inequality, bearing in mind that uh, no one knows what the future of inequality will be. 
but uh, we try to project uh, possible scenarios based on the continuation of past trends and variations uh, in the scenarios, uh, uh, variations uh, with respect to the business as usual. Now, the future of global inequality will depend on convergence forces mentioned by Thomas at the beginning of the presentation. So that is rapid growth in emerging countries, if we're optimistic, and divergence forces, which is rising inequality within countries. No one knows which of these two forces will dominate and whether current trends are sustainable. One point which we already mentioned is that so far, it is the divergence force which dominated over the reduction of between country inequality, perhaps a bit contrary to the general thinking of this idea, which, which generally puts forward, brings forward a reduction in global inequality between individuals thanks to this convergence. But we show that, unfortunately, this was not the case at this stage. What we show is that under business as usual, even with high growth in the emerging world, within country divergences will still prevail. Now, other pathways are possible. For instance, if all countries adopt a European inequality pathway, and here again, we do not seek to magnify the European situation, I will show why. Well, global inequality would decrease by 2050, but only very moderately dec decrease in fact. So it may be, it should be possible to do even better. In any case, we want to stress that the reduction of within country inequality has a tremendous impact on a global poverty eradication, as I will show. We were talking about wealth before. So first, the projection of wealth inequality in the future in the business as usual scenario. So here we have the evolution of the top 1% wealth share in China, Europe uh, and uh, the USA. So the left hand side of the graph, the red curve, we've already seen it. Uh, it evolved from 28% to 33% from 1980 to 2016. But here we plot other groups. So we plot the middle 40% that we could call the global middle class, the top 0,1% and the top 0,01%. And we assume business as usual. So the same rates of uh, growth uh, in wealth of these different groups in the future. What we see is that by 2050, there would be a catch-up of the global wealth middle class by the top 0,1%, so a squeezed global wealth middle class. Now, in the coming slides, I will show variations from this business-as-usual scenario, and I will focus on income inequality, for, for which we have much more data, so for which these projections make more sense at the global level as we do here. So what do we do here? You see from 1980 to 2016, the evolution of global income inequality. The red curve is the top 1% income share. We see that it increases, as we discussed earlier. The global bottom 50% in orange, relative stagnation uh, since 1980. And then we project it across uh, different scenarios. So the business as usual, it's the in-between scenario, in the sandwich between the green and the blue scenario. So we see that in business as usual, the top 1% income share increases from around 20% today to close to 25% in 2050. And this is with fairly optimistic income growth, average income growth assumptions in emerging countries even fairly uh, optimistic mm -hmm. growth assumptions in Africa, in Latin America, in the rest of Asia, that is not uh, <coughs> China, would lead to an increase uh, in global inequality if all countries follow the same within country inequality trajectory. And the global bottom 50% would also uh, be at a fairly similar level. Now, what happens when we uh, have variations from this scenario, well, in the uh, US case, explosion of global inequality. So if all countries in the future distribute their own growth, their own total growth, in the same way as US distributed its own total growth since 1980 across different groups of the population, the top 1% share would rise up to 27, 28%. And the bottom 50% would further decline. In the Europe case, we see a progressive 
convergence of the top one and of the bottom 50%, but as I said, uh, we're still far from convergence in the European cases. The final point here is that all this will matter enormously in terms of global poverty. So inequality, the distribution of growth indeed matters a lot in terms of global poverty. And what we show here is the average annual income per adult of the bottom 50% of the world income distribution, 1,600 uh, euros per year in 1980, 3,100 euros per year per adult today. And uh, if we look at the US scenario at the bottom and the green scenario at the top, we see a factor two difference in average income in living standards uh, depending on the uh, uh, repartition of growth in these countries. So, in the report, our aim is not to close the discussion on the types of policy to move from one scenario to another, rather to open it. But we discuss several uh, options. The role of progressive taxation, which is a proven tool to reduce the level of inequality and to finance the necessary investments in the social services that are required to lift the bottoms uh, the incomes of the bottom 50%. We also discuss the importance and the need for a global financial registry, and there will be a session tomorrow um, on this uh, specific question, which would reinforce the effectiveness of uh, tax progressivity in different countries with a registry uh, recording the ownership of uh, assets over the world. Uh, this information is currently held in private hands, the, the question is how do we bring this to uh, the public domain so that tax authorities can, discuss, uh, can access it. We'll discuss that tomorrow. We also uh, discuss the importance of equal access uh, to education and to well-paying jobs and sometimes the, uh, the very uh, important contradictions existing between the meritocratic discourse on equal access to education and the reality of uh, access to education. And here we stress also that the movement for more transparency on incomes, on wealth, also should be extended to transparency uh, in terms of real outcomes of education and their connections with economic inequality. Uh, important work has already been done in this domain with Rash Shetty, Emmanuel says, in the case of the US, many European countries would need much more uh, similar work. We uh, discuss this in the final part of the report. And finally, uh, it is important today in this context of sharp decline in public capital to reinvest in the future. So that is to recreate conditions for uh, public investments in health, in education, in ecological transition. This may require difficult choices. Again, our choice is not to um, provide a set of uh, a set of definite solutions to each and every country, but to open the debates. And we may also discuss this in the panel uh, discussion that will come in the following session. So to conclude, we started with uh, this idea that Whitworld is a collective, cumulative, international research project where we really aim to bring the most transparent data on the table. I would stress again here the importance of uh, the 100 researchers located all over the world, without who this report would not exist. I would also want to stress the importance of all the researchers based here at PSU, at the World Inequality Lab, just to name a few, uh, Thomas Blanchet, Richard Clark, Emmanuel Guetin, uh, Luis Esteves, Li Yang, to, to name but a few that have not already been named. Without them, this report would not exist. And what do we find in uh, this report? Well, we did the first systematic assessment of globalization in terms of inequality, and we showed that the top 1% captured twice as much growth as the bottom 50% since 1980. And that in business as usual, this is likely to, uh, to continue. However, even with uh, 
important uh, and optimistic assumptions for average growth in uh, the emerging world. However, we also showed that there were very different country trajectories and that this highlights the, the importance of policies, of different types of policies to tackle these rising inequality trends. Thank you very much for your attention. And you can find now the online version of the full report online.